Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 66 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for the week of July 19th to 25th, 2012. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson, and for about the next half hour or so, I will be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me. I think are worthy of your attention. As always, any comments, questions, reactions, uh, suggestions, tidbits, um, tips, whatever, uh, can, in fact, they should be uh, sent directly to me. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. And since, as always, I expect you didn't catch that on the fly, my uh, website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around here a couple of times during the show, and um, you can go there and get the email address directly from there. I do answer my email, as always, uh, but I uh, confess I can be a little slow about it, so just be a little bit patient with me. If, um, if you do send me email, my one request is that you um, say something like uh, your cable show or left side of the aisle or something like that in the subject line so that I can tell it's not spam. Now, you may notice right off the top that I have kind of surrendered to the uh, demands of the weather, the weather gods, as it were. In fact, I'll be talking about that a little bit more later on. But I do have some things uh, to talk about today. Some I have talked about before. Some I haven't talked about in a while. So let's get to it. I'm going to start by talking about, again, about the LIBOR scandal. Now, this has so far been largely confined to the United Kingdom but the thing is, it could jump right across the big pond and land straight in the lap of Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner. Now, LIBOR is, and again, it's the London Interbank Offered Offering Overnight. I've heard all three words used, but the London uh, Interbank Offered Rate. This is, in effect, the interest rate at which the biggest banks can get short-term loans from each other. Its importance is that many other loans, many other interest rates are pegged to it. Uh, it directly affects some $10 trillion in economic activity, and it's estimated that it indirectly affects about $800 trillion in economic activity. Uh, the, the business magazine The Economist calls it the single most important figure in finance. And there is clear evidence that those banks, those banks that, see, again, the way it works is that these banks kick in these numbers of these rates, and then um, they are averaged to get a daily rate. There is evidence that those banks have been actively manipulating those rates for their own benefit. Uh, one of these banks, Barclays, has already reached a settlement of something over $500 million uh, with regulators, and several other major banks, both here and abroad, are being investigated in several different countries. All right, here's the thing now. Between 2003 and the time he joined the Obama administration in 2009, Tim Geithner was director of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, or as it's commonly called, just the New York Fed. The New York Fed is regarded as the most powerful of the regional banks that make up the Federal Reserve System. And there have been, in recent times, increasing questions over what the Fed did or didn't know, didn't, or didn't do about LIBOR. Now, under pressure, the New York Fed released a series of documents late last week uh, related to these questions. And these documents show that more than four years ago, in fact, in December 2007, uh, at a time when Tim Geithner was in charge at the New York Fed, a representative of Barclays Bank told the New York Fed that LIBOR rates were unrealistically low. Several months later, in April 2008, uh, a New York Fed analyst asked a Barclays representative about LIBOR, and the representative of Barclays said, and I'm quoting here, we just fit in with the rest of the crowd, if you like. We know that we're not posting an honest LIBOR, and yet we're doing it because if we didn't do it, it draws unwanted attention to ourselves. Okay, and what was the response of the New York Fed to this, uh, this confession of manipulation and this, to, this assertion that all the other banks were also manipulating the figure? It was sympathy and understanding. You have to accept it, the, the representative said in response. I understand. It may not be what you want to do, but, you know, you, I understand completely. In other words, it was like, hey, you know, you got to do what you got to do for your own short-term benefit, and the rest of the world is just going to have to suck it up and deal with it. According to the Fed's documents, 
in the first part of 2008, as the result of these conversations, a summary of this admission of manipulation was circulated through the U.S. government, including the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department. As a result, on June 1st, 2008, Geithner sent a memo to the governor of the Bank of England. His name is Mervyn King. Um, he suggested um, some reforms of the, of the LIBOR figure. King responded that uh, Geithner's suggestions seemed sensible and passed them on to the British Bankers Association, which is the trade group that actually assembles the figures and calculates the daily rate. Okay, here's the thing, though. The Fed claims it continued to follow developments in LIBOR issues after that time, but there's no documentation of the fact. There is no reference to it in any of the documents they released other than a couple of phone calls over the course of the ensuing years. Um, and more importantly, uh, there, there's no evidence that Geithner's uh, recommendations were acted on. In fact, they weren't. Um, and there's no indication that the Fed actually pushed for these recommended, uh, recommendations to be adopted. And that's probably why in late October 2008, months after Geithner's memo to Mervyn King, a Barclays employee told a New York Fed representative that the LIBOR rates were absolute rubbish, quote unquote. And here's the really big thing. Mervyn King, again, he's the, he's the uh, governor of the Bank of England. He was addressing Parliament on July 17th. And he said he had not been sent the evidence of wrongdoing that the Fed had gathered. He said, quoting, the New York Fed did not raise any evidence of wrongdoing with regards to LIBOR. He's saying, I, I, I didn't know anything about this. Now, you could discount that statement as self-serving. I mean, after all, he is a banker. Uh, except for the fact that there is no evidence, either in Geithner's memo or anyone else, that Geithner or the Fed or anyone in the U.S. government anywhere informed any British regulator that they actually had evidence of manipulation of LIBOR. They wrote up their little memo, and then they forgot about it. And what's their defense? What's the Fed's defense? Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke told the Senate Banking Committee on Tuesday, July 17th. He said that the central bank did all it was required to do. To put that more clearly, in the face of a confession that a major international interest rate benchmark was being manipulated, they did the minimum required by law. More exactly, they did as little as possible. All right, so what's going to happen here as a result of all of this? What's going to happen here to Tim Geithner and to all these other people as a result of all this? Here in the U.S., I expect very little will happen, frankly. Uh, maybe there'll be some fines, maybe a resignation or two, but overall, no. There'll be no change. Here's why. The Obama gang is not going to go after, uh, go after this because to do so would involve going after their own guy, Tim Geithner. Now, while you think the Goppers might be willing to pounce on this, I mean, Geithner, after all, being Obama's Treasury Secretary and all, um, I figure they won't. Why? Because in order to go after, remember, Geithner's, Geithner's crime, if you can call it that, Geithner's misdoing, was that he concealed, he did not pursue knowledge of wrongdoing. To go after Geithner, they've got to go after the actual wrongdoing, which means to go after Geithner, they've got to go after the banks. And frankly, I just don't see them doing that. All right, we're going to move on from there to what is becoming a regular feature. It has actually, actually has become a regular feature of uh, left side of the aisle here, uh, the Clara Bell Award, given for meritorious stupidity. And this week, there has been just too much stupidity. Maybe it's the heat or something. But there's been so much stupidity that I couldn't pick just one award winner. So what I've actually got is a winner and two runner-ups. The second runner-up is a result of an article in Esquire magazine by a guy named uh, Tom Junod. It was entitled The Lethal, Lethal Presidency of Barack Obama. It's about the Obama administration reserving to itself the right to set up these kill lists of people to be assassinated without oversight, without, over, without outside input, without, minim, without even minimal transparency, or without even any acknowledgement of the policies, even after the fact, even after they kill innocent people. Now, I've talked about this issue several times, but this is what his article is about.
Now, in response to his article, June had said he received a telephone call from someone he described as, quoting him, a person with intimate knowledge of the executive counterterrorism policies of the Obama administration. And this guy told Juno that state secrecy exists to, pr to protect two essential things. Uh, the sources and methods of the intelligence community. Remember, those aren't under attack here. There's nobody's talking about revealing sources and names and, and methods and so on. But he said the other thing that needed to be protected was something he called, this is the caller called, the requirement of non-acknowledgement. State secrecy, that is, is vital to maintain because it enables the government to lie through its teeth to everyone, including the people of the United States. The state must be able to keep things secret so that the state can keep things secret. Now, frankly, that's like somebody arguing the sky is green and proving it because, well, the sky must be green because it's the sky and the sky is green. Therefore, the sky is green. I mean, how, more, how much more clownish can you get than that? Well, actually, you can. Here's our first runner-up. Witless Romney has been struggling to explain how it is that, according to him, he left his company Bain Capital in, uh, after 1999 when documents for the following three years show him as CEO, chairman, president, and sole stockholder of the company. They also show that in that time he took a six-figure salary, he signed corporate documents related to both major and minor deals, and he attended board meetings for at least two Bain-associated companies. Well, on July 15th, uh, senior uh, Romney campaign advisor Ed Gillespie went on CNN State of the Union and took another stab at digging out of this hole, uh, but instead he produced this. I'm quoting Gillespie. He, that is Romney, took a leave of absence, that again, in 1999. So he took a leave of absence, and in fact, he ended up not going back at all and retired retroactively to 1999 as a result. Romney retroactively retired. What a great concept. Gee, officer, you can't give me a speeding ticket because I retroactively turned off this road a mile back, so I wasn't even here. Retired retroactively, the phrase of a true clown which certainly will outlive its creator. Okay, here's the third. And I gave this one the award because of the importance of this issue. Now to start, you need to know that the Pentagon is, se is sending the aircraft carrier, the USS John Stennis, to the Persian Gulf region four months ahead of schedule and intends for it to stay there twice as long as originally planned. There is ongoing, even increasing tension in the region as Israel threatens preemptive airstrikes against Iran's nuclear facilities. Iran responds by threatening to close the Strait of Hormuz at the entrance to the Persian Gulf. And U.S. officials continue to make dark references to Iran's nuclear weapons program, even though our own intelligence services say there isn't an Iranian nuclear weapons program. Late last week on CNN's Situation Room, Wolf Blitzer uh, reported on what he described as an ominous new warning coming in from the Pentagon about Iran's nuclear program, about Iran's, excuse me, about Iran's missile program. Now this ominous new warning actually turned out to be an unsubstantiated Pentagon claim, and the Pentagon are the people, by the way, I call them the fear merchants. But this was actually, this ominous new warning was actually an unsubstantiated claim from three years ago. But that's not what won the Clown Award. This is. Um, this is an act of truly meritorious stupidity. Blitzer then turned to CNN's uh, Pentagon correspondent, a guy named Chris Lawrence. Now, Lawrence dutifully parroted the Pentagon claims about how Iranian missiles are becoming more accurate and more deadly. And then he said this. This is a quote. Iran already has a missile that could reach the U.S. if it could put it on a ship and move it within 600 miles of the American coastline. What kind of argument is that? I have a rock I could throw all the way to Iran if I could get within 100 feet of its border. I mean, how incredibly clownish is that kind of argument? This is especially considering that back in November, 
Um, Iranian leaders were boasting about the power of their navy, and the Pentagon mocked the idea that the Iranian navy could get anywhere near the United States. And at that time, CNN trotted out its own experts ridiculing the very notion that now they are presenting as so threatening. CNN, not only clowns, but clowns in service to the bigger clowns who want to push us into another insane war. And we are going to take a break. We're back. We're back. And uh, as we come back, we're going to go straight back into our regular weekly feature, The Outrage of the Week. Now, this week's outrage brings together two things I've talked about before, but neither one of them have I talked about recently. The New York City Police Department and the Occupy Movement. Now, the NYPD and the city government of New York are really full of themselves with regard to their supposed expertise and genius with regard to terrorism. As evidence of the city's supposed excellence, the, uh, the police department there, its allies, and, and the media have repeatedly said that the department has thwarted, or helped to thwart, 14 terrorist plots aimed at New York since 9-11. That figure has been recited repeatedly in the media uh, by New York State Congress people, and in fact by the police commissar, um, police commissioner himself. It's crap. The number's nonsense. Of the 14 supposed plots, as published by the NYPD, of the 14 supposed plots, only three of them actually involved actual developed terrorist plots involving New York City. One of them, in fact, the 2010 Times Square bombing, they didn't stop. The, the bomb didn't go off. They didn't stop it. It failed. Uh, the other two... One of them was uncovered by U.S. intelligence agencies, agents, and the other by British intelligence. In fact, in that one, the plan was to blow up airliners over the Atlantic. And the only connection to New York was that one of the people who was arrested had flight information about various flights in and out of various airports, including in New York City. And of the 11 other cases, three of them, and or, were ones in which government agents played the lead or the exclusive role, in fact, in some cases, to the point of actually creating the plot in order to ensnare people in it. Four of them were ones whose credibility or seriousness had been questioned by law enforcement officials to the point where in some of the cases, the feds wouldn't even press charges. And the other four involved cases in which a plot never got beyond the discussion stage. In fact, in one of them, an idea to, to take down the Brooklyn Bridge, this plot was abandoned before the cops even knew about it. This list is completely bogus, but this is the list that the police department is thumping its chest about. Now that definitely would actually be Clarabelle territory, but this actually, in this case, it just forms the backdrop. Now, I've gone after the New York PD uh, times before. One, uh, I've gone after it about its racist stop-and-frisk policy. Uh, I've gone after it about its intrusions into privacy, its violation of the First Amendment, and its illegal harassment and arrest of Occupy protesters. But now, New York cops have gone completely over the top and around the bend in their attempts to smear and discredit any dissenters from the policies of the Wall Street barons who are the ones who actually run their city. On March 26th, Occupy staged a protest about fare hikes and cuts in service in the New York City mass transit system. They did this by chaining open the gates at 20 subway stations across New York. The idea was that anybody could walk in and use the subway for free. Well, just over a week ago, on uh, July 10th, the NYPD announced that a DNA sample taken from a chain at one of those sites matched a sample found at the scene of the unsolved brutal murder of a Juilliard student named Sarah Fox in 2004. And that, you have to understand, is how the police presented it. They presented it as the unsolved murder of Sarah Fox has been linked to Occupy via DNA. And that, of course, is how the media presented it. 
The New York Observer, The Gothamist, The Daily Mail, The Associated Press, The Village Voice, The Philadelphia Inquirer, The Wall Street Journal, CBS New York, NBC New York, Gawker, every single one of them featured a headline of exactly the sort the cops wanted. Every one of them had a headline along the lines of DNA evidence, DNA evidence links murder to Occupy. Every single one of them. And not one of them mentioned until several paragraphs into the story that the cops have no idea whose DNA was on that chain. And in fact, it could have come from anyone who touched that chain, which means it could have been a subway rider who had no connection whatsoever to the protest. And not one of these articles even mentioned the possibility of error in the DNA analysis, except to deny it. And not one of them even mentioned the possibility of a contaminated sample at all. This is despite the fact that a year before, a report from the New York Civil Liberties Union had been able to point to independent research that showed, quoting that research, an unexpectedly high incidence of error and fraud in the collection, handling, and analysis of DNA evidence, mislabeling of samples, cross-contamination of samples, misinterpretation of results, misrepresentation. And that research showed these problems to exist in labs across the country, including the one in New York. Now, nearly 24 hours later, after those screaming headlines, Investigators are reporting that, quoting, contamination at a city laboratory could have led to the match between DNA found at the murder scene of a Juilliard student eight years ago and a chain used at a recent Occupy Wall Street protest. In fact, a source who had been briefed on the investigation told the New York Times that both samples, the one from 2004 and the one from the chain, actually came from a police department employee who works with the office of the chief medical examiner. So there was no reason to connect any Occupy protester to the murder. There is even less than no reason, if there can be such a thing, to occupy the movement as a whole to it. Yet, bluntly, that's exactly what the cops did, consciously, deliberately. And that is exactly what the media went along with and amplified, either consciously and deliberately, or as the worst of incompetent, lazy, butt-kissing buffoons. Now, some people will see those updates. Some people will look at them and go, oh, I see. But how many thousands will not? How many thousands will only recall the headlines and, thanks to the lies of the cops and the complicity of the media, how many thousands of people are now going to come away with the notion in their back of the heads that Occupy is harboring murderers? That is an outrage. It is the outrage of the week. Okay. For last here... Um, I'm going to go back to something again that I've talked about before, but not in a while. Uh, global warming. Global warming is back in the news. The U.S. today is seeing wildfires, freak storms, uh, thousands of temperature records being broken. The last 12 months in the United States were the hottest 12-month stretch on record. The first six months of 2012 were the hottest six-month stretch on record. In fact, if you take the average temperature... Uh, uh, each month for the last 13 months and compare it with past average temperatures for that same month, what you find is that every one of those months ranked in the top third of its historical distribution. That is, uh, June 2011 was in the top third of all, of all Junes, in the top third of the hottest Junes on record. July 2011 was in the hottest, thir uh, hottest third of July records on record, and so on and so on and so on. This is the first time this has happened in recorded history, and according to the National Oceanics and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, according to NOAA, the odds of this occurring randomly are about 1 in 1.6 million. In fact, it's been so hot that we've actually had events like this, where a jet got trapped at Reagan Airport outside Washington, D.C., because it had been so hot that the tarmac softened and the plane sank four inches down and, in fact, had to be towed out in order to be able to take off. We've seen the worst droughts in over 50 years. Here's the, look at this map. This map shows the extent of the drought. 
It's the worst drought in over 50 years. Some 56% of the land service of the continental U.S., over half of the continental United States, was designated to be in some form of drought. Now, admittedly, this is not as bad a drought as the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, but it is the worst in over 50 years, and it ain't over yet. According to a Washington Post Stanford University poll in June now, over three quarters of Americans now accept that human activity is at least partly responsible for the rising temperatures, and yes, something needs to be done about it. That's a finding that could find an echo in a recent uh, editorial in the Salt Lake City Tribune, which was headlined, A Hotter West, Climate Change Effects Undeniable. Now, as I've said many times before, one hot spell no more proves global warming than one cold snap disproves it. Assigning a particular weather event to global warming is, uh, is uh, well, it's problematic at best. But what we're seeing here is not a single event. It is a series of a variety of events, a lengthening series of variety of events, an increasingly long string of such events. Now, each of those events on their own proves nothing. But taken together, they are a mountain, a mass of data that persistently, consistently, insistently points to the same conclusion. We are screwing with the climate to our own harm and our own pain. Now, what's more, the latest, which comes out every year, but it's the latest State of the Climate Report, it's called, coming out of NOAA. It notes that scientists are increasingly able to assign probabilities to weather events. That is, not to say, yes, this weather event would have happened uh, without global warming, or no, it would not have happened except for global warming, but how likely it would have been. For example, now, during a La Nina year, La Nina is a weather oscillation in the Pacific that actually causes somewhat cooler temperatures. In a La Nina year, a heat wave in Texas in such a year is now 20 times more likely than it was 50 years ago. As a result of climate change, unusually warm Novembers in Great Britain are now 60 times more likely than they were 50 years ago, and cold Decembers are half as likely as they were. Go back to that drought map. Now, again, this is not the worst drought on record, but droughts like this are becoming more and more common, and they're more likely than they were 50 years ago. We are simply more likely to experience more droughts, more freak storms, more record high temperatures than we have ever been in the history of weather. In the words of Deputy NOAA Administrator Catherine Sullivan, every weather event that happens now takes place in the context of a changing global environment. And by the way, that report uses 43 different indicators and uses results of scientists from around the world. Um, one last thing to give you some bad dreams. Even with La Nina conditions in 2011, where there actually was a double La Nina in 2011, 2011 global sea surface temperatures were among the 12 highest on record. Here's the thing. Ocean heat content uh, has risen since 1993. It continues to rise. Why are air and surface temperatures not even higher than they were? Because the heat is going into the oceans. And once the oceans absorb all the heat that they can, and people fear that time is coming, then you're really going to see the heat temperatures rise. That's it. I'm done. I'm out of here. You have the best week you can.